if you believe it all your heart that the holy god is truly holy yes. and that the name of the lord jesus christ is greater than all names yes. do you believe that yes. then that name is greater than the name covid 19 that name is greater yes, so if that name is greater why do you need to fear amen you need not fear yes, but that doesn't also mean we don't use some common sense of precaution you can be precautious but not be fearful yes. you don't walk in fear no. you can be precautious take some cautious steps for safety and all that but you don't come under the fear and live under fear because the name of the lord jesus is higher greater and mightier amen amen you know i'm sure you have heard of cases where people who take who took the vaccine or who didn't take the vaccine they die yeah. right yeah. so th- th- even those who took the vaccine they get reinfected and some other complication comes on their bodies and they die right so where is the safety then only in the lord jesus christ only in the lord jesus that does not mean i am against vaccine i am not advocating that but i am saying ultimately our safety should only be on the lord jesus christ Amen. whether you take the vaccine it's not sinful and it is not the mark of the beast period all right so that should dispel all the misinformations that are flying in cyberspace <laughs> don't believe all those rubbish i tell you today don't believe all those rubbish <clears throat> it's just another virus that the lord jesus christ had prophesied that in the last days there will be pestilences not only this but worse than this will come at the initial birth of the covid 19 i was up in in the northern part of india ministering at a youth conference it was just at that time that this uh, covid-19 was becoming full blown just starting you know and one night i was called by the lord to come and meet with him so i went to wait on the lord and the word of the lord came to me that what you are seeing in the world now this covid-19 is nothing compared to what is going to come next this is nothing if we can be so fearful about this covid-19 a worse than covid-19 is coming soon and it is not the delta variant see first was alpha the first one then came beta the second one then now is delta tomorrow maybe gamma <laughs> don't laugh i am not joking you know just this morning one of our dear partner from tanzania died of covid i was so broken hearted our he's, he's a young man in his early 50s with two little children and uh, early i think about 2 weeks ago his wife called to say that her husband was afflicted with this covid and he was becoming very breathless and asked for prayer and in just 2 weeks it spread all over and he died so this is not a laughing matter you must learn when to love when not to love 
not laugh at a kind of a pestilence that is sweeping the whole world. You know, it's not just in one nation or two nation. And the U.S. is reporting a great number of COVID cases. So why should you laugh? It's very foolish to laugh at this thing when the whole world is being brought to her knees by an invisible enemy. It's not a visible enemy that you can just punch or throw weapons and kill them, you know. This is an invisible enemy. You won't even know from which direction this enemy is coming, right? The good, the bad, the ugly, the believer, the non-believer, everybody is getting infected. In fact, to the best of my knowledge that I was informed, at least 200 pastors have died in South India because of COVID. So aren't they praying people? You tell me. Aren't they praying people? Yes. Aren't they washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus? Yes. Filled with the Holy Spirit? Yes. Then, how did the disease come? It came, right? So the disease doesn't see whether you are a believer or you are not a believer. The disease has no eyes. It only has one assignment. To kill, to steal, to destroy. That is the disease assignment. And I do know for absolute sure, this is a judgment from God. So, for us to be safe from this judgment is to live like what Pastor Sweet said earlier, a sanctified life. So when you live a sanctified life, then the disease could not even come near your shadow because you are sanctified. You are pure, clean and holy and you will stand in holy ground all the time. So when you stand in holy ground all the time and the holy ground is the fire of God Amen. and that fire will extinguish, kill and destroy any germs. Do you believe that? Yes. Some years ago, maybe about 50 years ago, have you heard of John G. Lake? Yes. So he went to South Africa at the height of the bubonic plague to minister to the suffering and dying South Africans. And when he came to the medical camp to help the doctors, they told him to put on all the safety equipment and the uh, headgear and uh, all this uh, protection like you see nurses and doctors wear today it's called PPE so he said no I don't need to wear all that no disease will touch me so the doctors were very surprised he said no 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 you have to put it on so he said okay all right let's do one thing let's test let's do a test and he said, okay, what's your test? Make a small cut on my skin and take the most deadliest of the bubonic plague cells and put on my skin. The moment it touches my skin, those cells will die. If they die, then I won't wear. If I die, then what, what to wear? Okay, now you can laugh what to wear, right? So after much persuasion, the medical team agreed to the test. So they made, made a small cut on his hand, put his hand under the microscope, and they took the most deadliest of the bubonic cells from a man who just died and put on his hand. And they saw under the microscope, as soon as those bubonic plague viruses touch John G. Lake's hand, they died. The disease died. This was documented. See, when you walk, for that to happen, there are two conditions. Condition number one, 
living the sanctified life condition number 2 to believe beyond all shadow of doubt he that is in you is greater he that is in this world now that belief should not be a head knowledge it should be a heart knowledge it should sink inside you that from the innermost of your heart you know and you know and you know he that is in you is greater than he that is in this world so what is in this world at that time be bonic plague what is in the world at this present time covid 19 virus so is he that is in you greater yes yes only a few people say yes all the no 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 the rest of you who didn't say yes you have been very honest because you are not sure whether you really believe that the lord jesus is the greater one inside you i appreciate your honesty that's how you should really be not just simply say yes and that would be just empty faith and you will die but to walk in that faith is it possible or not possible absolutely possible absolutely possible and how to walk in that very simple get the word inside you not just reading the word but meditating the word day and night then efficient 610 will become real in your life be strong in the lord and in the power of his might when when you walk in the strength then no weapons that are formed against you shall ever prosper amen, amen. so one of the weapons is covid 19 Let it be COVID nineteen, COVID twenty, twenty one, twenty two, whatever number. You will stand strong. Evening. This evening and tomorrow evening and the day after will be just part one, part two, and part three. We'll just build it up to form a beautiful picture. of that which god wants us to know there was once a little baby formed in the mother's womb you know when a baby is in a mother's womb the baby doesn't see the outside world all the baby can see is a wall around it and waters so one day the mother spoke to the baby You know, you have a lovely father, and this is how the father looks like. And you have a lovely sister, and this is how she looks like. And this is you have a lovely brother, and this is how he looks like. The mother went on explaining to the child, and the baby was listening. And the baby spoke, "No, you are telling me lies. There is no such thing as a father. I don't even know you exist." I don't think there is a brother or a sister. The baby doesn't know because he doesn't see. But just because the baby doesn't see, it does not mean they all don't exist. They all exist, but just because the baby has not experienced them or had seen them or had known them, it cannot comprehend how the father looks like or how the mother looks like because it has not seen and the baby grew and grew and grew and every day the mother would tell the baby how the sun looks like how the moon looks like and the baby will keep on protesting no you are lying they all don't exist so one fine day the time came for the baby to be born and when the baby came out of the mother's womb and then he saw for the first time the father and it realized that the father was real saw the sister saw the brother saw the sun saw the moon saw the stars and realized all things are real 
and then it believed. My dear brothers and sisters, heaven is a real place. Amen? Amen. It is real. And many, many things that are in heaven are not written in the Bible. Only some, very little is written for us to know that there is a heaven and there is a God and there are some things in heaven. You know, even the angelic government or the angelic um, order, very little is revealed in the word. There are much more. That much more is not necessary for us to know. So it is not written there. But whatever is of God is giving us a glimpse that there are such things. Let me give you an example. Our mind can only comprehend and imagine that which we have seen. Our mind can proceed with the available mission. It cannot process which it has not seen or that which it does not know. It cannot. Now when the apostle was taken up to heaven, he saw the four living creatures. And if you read the scriptures very carefully, he describes them. I saw the head look like a lion. Now please take note of the phrase, like a. It's not a lion. Like a lion. Like a flying eagle. How does a flying eagle look like? A flying eagle looks like a flying eagle, isn't it? <laughs> but how can a, a something that looks like a flying eagle be stuck in the head? Can you imagine, you know, eagles have long, big wingspan, right? Six to eight foot in length. So with the stretching of the eagle's wings, stuck in the head and then there is another head that looks like a lion then there is another head that looks like a man how is it possible please take note like a lion like a man like a calf like a flying eagle but they are all not like that when he saw that's the best he could describe with the available information that he knows by the grace of God, I have seen these living creatures. And when I saw, I saw, I know. But how would I describe them? Just like how John had described them. But that's not exactly how they look like. We cannot describe them because there are no earthly words. Similar earthly words, such words don't exist. For example, there are only seven colors in this world. So we know all the seven colors, how they look like. And whatever co other colors that supposedly are produced. See, if you buy a LCD monitor for your computer, they boast 16.4 million colors. How in the world they counted all that is a mystery. <laughs> You know, how they come with all this combination of 16.4 million colors. Anyway, let's not bother about all that. We look at all the numbers, we, we think we are getting a good deal. But how do we know really? <laughs> anyway. But in heaven, there are many, many colors. And when you look at the eighth color in heaven, how to describe the eighth color? when a word on earth does not exist. So you can just say, hmm, something like a combination of red, green, blue, yellow, white. You see, do you follow what I'm trying to say? Yes, yes. So, heaven is a beautiful, limitless treasure house. And it is a father's good pleasure for all his children to know of the things that are in store for them so that 
when you cross this earth when you cross this world to the next world you are in familiar territory you are not at loss not knowing what to do or not when you meet the cherubim you will know this is a cherubim because a cherubim again they don't look like ordinary angels they are awesome creatures they be, they don't belong to the ordinary angelic order they belong to a different order anyway so let's come back so with this in mind this is the word the lord told me to bring to you during these days turn your bibles with me to the book of ezekiel chapter 1 the book of ezekiel is a very fascinating book but we are not going to study the book of ezekiel just chapter 1 and the verse 1 now it came to pass in the 30th year in the fourth month in the fifth day of the month as i was among the captives by the river of cheba that the heavens were opened and i saw visions of god so my message is entitled during this three days when the heavens open this this will be the series and then we'll go from message to message when the heavens open what happens when the heavens open the first thing is you see visions of god in order to see a vision of god the heaven must be opened so we must learn firstly this is how we are going to build up what happens when the heavens open secondly how to create an open heaven it is possible you know to create an open heaven where you can always live under an open heaven don't don't be satisfied with just getting a little touch from god how many of you like visitations from god you poor thing <laughs> you know why visitations are temporary you should hunger for a habitation the difference between a visitation and a habitation is visitation just comes like a wind habitation you abide wow. you are always abiding in the house of god so when you are abiding in the house of god you can walk in you can walk out because it's our father's house wow so nobody can chase you out that's awesome so remember this don't yearn for a visitation Don't go from conference to conference just getting goosebumps. <laughs> no, we don't need goosebumps. Let the gooses alone. <laughs> It is God's greatest desire for us to come into a habitation. All during the three and a half years of the Lord's ministry, He was pulling the people. especially his disciples into that realm but they were only concerned with being or the seated at the right hand of god or the left hand of god they were dull of understanding he tried his best to teach them but they were more concerned about mundane things even when he took them up on the mountain and was transfigured before them and peter and john and james had this awesome awesome privilege to see the glorified lord jesus and moses and elijah and to hear the voice of the father god and the glory of the holy spirit after seeing all that look at this how his mind was working oh lord let's build a temple for you a temple for elijah a temple for Moses and also make a temple for ourselves. See look how mundane their minds were. Instead of being caught up 
they could have, you know, they could have, let's imagine, this was where the Lord Jesus was standing. And Elijah and Moses were standing there. And this was where, where these three disciples were. They could have just walked and communed with them. They could have. But, but look at them. They just stood there and wanted to make an idol out of this whole thing. See, they wanted to make a monument, built a kingdom. We are not here for that purpose. The only kingdom we are going to build is God's kingdom. Not my kingdom, not your kingdom. See, we should never, never idolize the things of God. But look how carnal the minds are. As it was 2,000 years ago, so is it today. We have never progressed much. We've only made little progress. We are still very, very carnal. That is why we still remain babes in our Christian life. We have not progressed to be the matured sons of God. The day you stop praying for the daily necessities of your life, that is the day, the sign that you are very matured to be a son of God. Why do I say that? You may feel that I am contradicting scripture. No, I am not. I am showing you a far better way. The scripture says, even before you open your mouth and ask, your Father in heaven knows. So if you abide in Christ all the time, the Father looks at your heart. And when He looks at your heart, He can see that you are feeling hungry. And He will provide you a beautiful hamburger. <laughs> of course, minus the fat. <laughs> when He sees your heart, you have a need for, a, for clothes. He will provide you one. Because you are abiding in Christ all the time. And your heart is naked before the Lord Jesus all the time for Him to see. See, that is another higher realm where you can enter into where this scripture is fulfilled. That I am known by God. The Apostle Paul used that word. That I may know Him and be known by Him. Not only you know God, but does God know you? Of course he knows that such a person exists. But this is beyond knowing you as a physical identity. Knowing you right to the core of your bone. That God knows no matter what he tells you to do, you will never say no. Of this is written of Abraham. I know him. So when God told him, sacrifice your son, you'll never read anywhere that Abraham protested. See, he's not a protestant. <laughs> he was a friend of God. Never, never use the word protestant again, alright? It's a cursed word. Because he was a friend of God, and the Bible says, he believed that God is able even to bring the dead back to life. Look at the belief. Even if I killed my son to fulfill God's command, he is able to bring him back to life. Look at that belief. When you come to that level, which is possible, it is not impossible. It is possible. And why it is impossible? Because we have too much of fat in our soul. We have not crucified our fat. We are asking God to crucify us. The Bible says, you crucify. You know, instead of crucifying, we are praying, Lord, take this away. See, we are all great hypocrites. 
we are asking God to do something and the word tells you it's you should do it you know the Bible says humble yourselves but what do we do we pray Lord make me humble you don't want to but you're asking him to force you to it doesn't work that way the scripture says nowhere in the entire Bible you'll ever find anywhere where it says pray that you may be humble the scripture says pray that you may be counted worthy to escape from the damnation that's going to come upon the face of this earth but the scripture says you humble yourself see there's a big difference between prayer and action there are many many things that we are doing wrong that's why Christianity is not working that's why it appears to the outside world Christianity doesn't work Christianity doesn't work because the people who claim to believe don't practice what the word says if Christianity is not real I made the greatest mistake in my life by bec becoming a Christian you know I was so happy worshipping 330 million gods <laughs> why give up 330 million and accept this one God if he was not the only true living God if he was not I made the greatest mistake in my life see if I were to ask you would you like one million dollars or three hundred and thirty million dollars what would you choose three hundred and thirty right so which is better three hundred and thirty million gods or one god certainly three hundred and thirty million gods why go for this one god if it's just one among the many now that's why every good Hindu they worship at least a dozen gods so that if one is busy the other one will help you <laughs> that's true you know I'm not making fun of my own faith <laughs> we literally pray like that we say make sure that you answer my prayer in case he forgets So you see, in Hinduism, we have an alternative. Look at Christianity, there's only one God. If He fails you, right. you are doomed. <laughs> if He is not the only true living God. Jesus. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, we have a great God. Yes. Not just a great God, a real God. Yes. A real God who demands real people not hypocrites that we have become but real people when you live a real Christian life America would be born again tomorrow America today is becoming more Buddhist is because of the hypocrisy in the church so that's why people are leaving they see hypocrisy in the among the congregation they see hypocrisy in the pulpit so they think this is not real so they are losing we are losing people on the judgment day the church of Jesus Christ must give a big account to God for all the souls that has gone to hell because of our lifestyle because of our actions because of the words that we we have spoken my dear brothers and sisters before sin came there was an open heaven all the time the realm of heaven and the earth were one let me give you an example this Bible says in Matthew chapter 18 verse 18 and 19 
where two or three are gathered in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, He is in our midst. Do you know this scripture? Yeah. Do you all believe this scripture? Yeah. Is there anyone here who don't believe? You all sincerely believe this scripture? Where there are two or three gathered in my name, I am in your midst. Everybody agrees? Yeah. Now, there are more than three of us here. So please show me where is the Lord Jesus. Where? Where is he? Don't tell me. Please don't be spiritual right now and tell me he's in the spirit. I know that very well. According to the scripture, no, not in your heart. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible does not say, where two or three gather, I am in your heart. For the Lord to be in your heart, you don't need two or three. Right. Just one is enough. Uh, wow. So, tell, show me please, in this big, huge auditorium, where is the Lord Jesus according to that scripture? I don't say it's in the mist. Okay, tell me where is in the mist. I only see two cameramen in the mist. <laughs> where in the mist? You see, that scripture must be real. Right. If it says, I am in your mist, he is in our mist. Not just, don't spiritualize the scripture. The scripture, you know, many times we spiritualize everything that we don't understand. Or we cannot explain. The Lord Jesus simply said, I will be in your midst. He is in our midst, but where? See, this is where heaven and earth must become one. In this building, two realms exist at the same time. The natural realm and the spiritual realm. The Lord is in the spiritual realm of this building. Right here. And I have proved this once in a church. I, I preached this scripture. I said I will prove to you right now. That when these two becomes one, you all will see the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, I asked, okay, come on, let's everybody get on our knees. So they all got on their knees. And I led them to worship the Lord. I led them to worship the Lord until all their hearts and minds became one. When they all became one, every person in that church saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing in their midst. Wow. Not a spiritual, spiritualizing of scripture, you know, real. This is real for everyone. Because the Bible says, right? If the Bible says, and if you believe the Bible is true, it is true. So let's not spiritualize something because we don't believe or we can't see. So when heaven and earth becomes one, the two realms become one, heaven is open and you will see visions of God. Before sin, Adam lived in an open heaven. The spirit realm and the natural realm was one. There were not two. Adam always saw God and God saw him and they both had beautiful concourse, speakings, fellowship with one another every day, every day. But when sin came, Isaiah 59 verse 2 tells us, it created two realms. The spiritual realm and the earthly realm was separated. And what was the physical sign of that? Adam and Eve were chased away from the presence of God. From that moment onwards, they never saw God again. They never saw. The earthly realm was created. But through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 to 53, when the temple veil was torn in two, the spiritual realm and the natural realm became one again. Wow. Through the tearing of the body of Jesus Christ. 
The tearing of the temple veil is just a physical sign of the tearing of the heart of the Lord Jesus. And the Bible says in Matthew, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 22, Now a way has been made, a way has been made for you. Once you enter into the Lord Jesus, you are transported into the heavenly realm. It's not transported, you just step into it is difficult to describe it, you know. One moment you are there, next moment you are not there. It, it exists, both ways it exists. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, the two realms have become one. Let me give you an example. In Luke chapter 17, verse 21, the Lord Jesus Christ said, The kingdom of heaven is within you. What does it really meant by that? The kingdom of heaven is within you. Inside you? Now again, let's not spiritualize. Something that the Lord Jesus did not say, it is a spiritual entity. Now take that scripture, Luke 17, 21. And we need to stay together with 2 Corinthians 6.16. And 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, You are the temple of God, and where God walks in you, and you talk with Him. Now, try to imagine for a moment, if it is just spiritual, this, your body is a temple of God, how big is your body? This side. Let's say I'm a shorty. A shorty like me. And I told you Jesus Christ is at least six foot tall. Even if you want to spiritualize it that he can shorten himself to my height, and how small can he shorten himself and walk in and walk out? So it cannot mean that. I show you a mystery. In the year 1991, the Holy Spirit called me to fast for three days. On the third day, as I was fasting, my spiritual eyes were opened. And I looked into, when I looked into, I saw my body. Every organ inside my body were not there. I was shocked because it was contrary to medical science. I wanted to become a neurosurgeon. So I have studied medicine and biology very well and I know exactly where all the organs are. So when I looked, there was nothing. Rather, instead I saw every wall of my body was shining with Shekinah glory of God. And there was a kind of a cloud, a glory cloud flowing all within me. And I was looking, of course, my mind was wondering what happened to the stomach, what happened to the lungs, what happened to this, that, all the organs, you know. And I then heard the voice of the Holy Spirit say, what you are seeing is what the word says, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost limitless temple inside you a limitless temple and when you become very quiet before the Lord within you you are inside heaven itself I hope I'm not confusing you am I I'm sorry if I am but there is no other better way to explain it some things are difficult to understand and comprehend unless you experience it. See, when I experience it, I understood the scripture. It is more than what the Bible says. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Many times when I'm praying, when I become very quiet and I wait on the Lord, I am just lost in a trance. When I'm lost in a trance, I'm just inside 
and walking with the Lord Jesus, and I see him come walking, and we talk, and he will give me directions, what I should do, where I should go, and what I should do in the ministry. Every single direction is given to me by the Lord during these moments that I am waiting on him. Now this is not only necessary for you to do the ministry, even for your everyday life. The choices that you make, you can make a wrong choice and regret for the rest of your life. Or you can just simply take some little time and crucify your microwave culture. You know, in the Western world, we all live in a microwave culture. You have TV dinner, TV lunch, everything you want in a GIF. You have a drive-by McDonald's, you have a drive-by Pizza Hut, soon you'll have a drive-by church. You just drive by the church, make one run around the church and you have got blessed. Just like what the Easterners do. They walk around the temple and they believe that when you walk around the holy temple, you are made holy. See, the Western society or the Western church does not know how to wait on God. We want everything in an instant. God does not work like instant noodles, you know. When you come to God, we must quietly wait. If you cannot wait, don't ever bother to seek the will of God. That's our problem with us today. We want everything in a jiff. When the heavens are opened, we see the visions of God. Let me give you a few examples from the scriptures. What happens when the heavens are opened? This will just build you up for you to know what exists and how real they can become so that every thing that you read in the Bible, every experience every man of God had that you read in the Bible can become yours. You believe that? Yes. They are not only written to be in a textbook like this, you know. They are written here so that you may know they are real and you can possess them. They are not written there simply because some wonderful saints were only greatly privileged and not you. Firstly, when the Lord Jesus Christ was baptized in the water, Luke chapter 3 verse 21 says, when he came out of the water, he was praying. And as he was praying, what was he praying for? He was praying for the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy in Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 4 was praying for the seven spirits of the Lord to come upon him. Bible says, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. He was praying, as he was praying, the heavens were opened. And when the heavens opened, John the Baptist saw the Holy Spirit coming down upon him, like in the form of a dove. See again, the Bible authors use the very accurate word, like a dove. Not a duff. It just looked like a duff coming down. You cannot put a form for the Holy Spirit. You know. I have seen the Holy Spirit many times like a duff flying down into the meetings. And as soon as it came down, everyone in our congregation, we, we hold a youth conference every year in India. 600 young people come from all over the Himalayan mountains. And during those moments when the Holy Spirit comes like a duff, in that one instant, all the 500 of them who come up to be baptized in the Holy Spirit are filled with the Holy Spirit and they start speaking in unknown tongues without a single hand laid on anyone when the Holy Spirit comes like a dove. And the Bible says 
God the Father spoke to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, two great events took place. The heavens opened and there was a vision. Secondly, in Luke chapter 9, verses 29 to 35, you will read the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he was praying, his face changed. The Apostle Luke uses the word, his face was altered into something. You know the Greek word used for the word altered means change into something. Now what does that mean? Change into something. The Lord Jesus Christ with a human face like us, he was praying. As he was praying, we do not know how long the prayer meeting took place. It must be very long because it put three person to sleep. <laughs> so it couldn't be a short prayer, right? And the Lord Jesus Christ is always accustomed to praying hours. And the disciples were accustomed to sleeping. <laughs> so as he was praying, the glory of God began to shine on him and his face was altered. Altered into what? Change into something. What did it change into? Anybody likes to make a wild guess? Son of glory. Mm. I do not know how the Son of Glory looks like, you know. Shekinah. Oh, Shekinah Glory. Anyway, there is a good guess, but I don't know. Because the Bible doesn't say. It just simply says, change into another. So, when it was changed into another, the Holy Ghost came and shone around the Lord Jesus. You know, I must tell you something very interesting about this event. The transfiguration. The transfiguration, light shining out from the Lord Jesus Christ, did not come from an external source shining upon him, but the light that was within him began to break out through his skin and shone all over him. Wow. You know, there are sweat, sweat pores in our body, right? The light that was inside the Lord Jesus Christ, it increased and increased in intensity as he was praying. You see, he always says, I am light. So the light that was within him as he was praying grew and grew and grew and grew. It, the intensity was increasing and finally it broke through. It seeped through the sweat pores and was shining through all throughout his body. And then it increased and increased until the scripture says he was shining brighter than the noonday sun. And the Lord Jesus Christ once taught me, and I wrote this in my book called Into His Likeness that it is absolutely possible for any ordinary believer to have the same transfigurational experience. Absolutely possible. If you would practice the same principles that the Lord Jesus Christ practiced, it is absolutely possible whether you are a spiritual giant or a dwarf. Whether you are a mature believer or a simple believer, it doesn't matter. What matters is the longing of your heart. That matters more than your seniority or superiority in the Christian life. And Elijah and Moses appeared and they were talking with him. Now that is another marvelous experience. This is not necromancy talking to the dead, you know. The Bible says very clearly, God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Wow. If He is the God of the living, 
then how can there be a date? So where did we get all this kind of theology from? Certainly not from the Bible. We cooked up, we cooked up all this kind of weird stuffs to keep the church again in the dark ages. Wow. You know, our pastor Ken has a beautiful poster in his office. And I told him I have the same poster in my office. This poster shows all you saints who are members of this church should buy that poster because you'll see your pastor in the poster. <laughs> the man in the poster looks a little bit like him. So he's standing at a pulpit and he's preaching with the Bible in his hand and on his left side, on his right side, there is two angels and a few Old Testament prophets who are standing there. It's a poster. And why I like the poster very much because it's not just a painting, it is real. I have been experienced like that many, many times. Heaven, you see, heaven and earth becomes one. When they become one, the ministering spirits like to work together with us. The Bible does not say ministering spirits are angels. So, where did we then, why did we then identify the ministering spirits as angels? Now, this is another mystery. Are you open to receive all this? Yes. yes. Come on. You are? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Shall I go on? Yes. I only have 15 more minutes, you know. Shall I go on? Yes. Okay. When the heavens are opened, the Bible says in Genesis 28, verses 12 and 13, angels are seen coming and going. Jacob had that experience. Fourthly, when the heavens are open, in Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 4 says, the apostle, the prophet Isaiah saw seraphims flying around the throne of God. And when the vision heavens are open, Acts chapter 7, verse 56 says, the apostle Stephen, or the evangelist Stephen, saw God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ standing in heaven. Of course, he couldn't have seen the Father's face. He saw a form. And he knew in his heart that was the Father when the heavens are opened. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 says, John saw a door opened in heaven. That is another language to describe the opened heaven. Now within the door that was opened in heaven, you will read in Revelation chapter 10 verse 19 and chapter 15 verse 5, a temple, John saw a temple and the temple was open. So within the open door in heaven, there is another open door, another open door, another, you see, heaven is a limitless place, a limitless place. That is why if you have ever read any books of, by any saints who had visitations from heaven, no two persons story becomes the same as one. The reason is because of this. Heaven is a limitless place. What one person sees is not the same as what the other person sees. They don't contradict, they complement each other. And the other matter is this, what you are privileged to see corresponds to your spiritual maturity. According to your spiritual maturity, you are enabled to see an object. For example, let's say, can all of you, do all of you see a pulpit here? Anybody here doesn't see one? Okay. And you see this pulpit here, we have this uh, bar here, or four bars, do you see, do you all see that? Yeah. Okay, which all means that we all are of the same maturity. Let's say, suppose, this object is in heaven. 
according to our maturity, this object we see as it is. Someone who is higher or lower, they see the same object in a different dimension. When John saw the cherubims, he described them, he was privileged to see them according to his level of maturity. Today, with a higher anointing or higher revelation of the word, if you see the cherubim, you will see them in a different dimension and able to comprehend and understand in a different way rather than how John had seen or described them. Do you follow? Yes. So, heaven is a limitless vast place. So, never, never be dogmatic and hold on to just one view. You know, let me tell you one truth. The Bible describes the Apostle Paul saying that he went to the third heaven. Have you read that? Yes. There are more than three heavens. There are more than three heavens, you know. Paul was only shown the third heaven so that he has written in the Bible so that you may know that there are more than one. That does not limit to three. There are more. The realm where all the general saints are congregated is called the general assembly. And then there is a different place where all the martyrs are. The martyrs don't mix together with the general assembly. They are in a different realm all by themselves. Then there is another realm where all those who walk very closely with God, like Enoch, like Moses, they are in a different realm. How many heaven so far? Three, right? Then there is another realm where the Lord Jesus Christ abides in, all by himself, that is his realm. Then there is another realm where exclusively the Father God abides. No one goes there. How many ready so far? Five. Shall I go on further? And there are many more. Many, many, many more. The realm where all the cherubims are, the realm where all the seraphims are, even the angelic order divided into different categories. And they fellowship among themselves, they laugh, they joke, they don't cry. They have their own communities, dwelling places. Am I going too far? No. Is it okay? Yes. Shall we continue? Yes. Heaven is a bountiful, wonderful place. Angels are not robotic beings who simply do that which the Father commands. No. You know, when they have nothing else to do, they'll just talk among themselves. Let's say, for example, while these services are going on, they all are here and they have nothing to do, right? So, either they are listening to me or if they are getting bored of listening to me because they have heard me saying this many times before. <laughs> so they will be busy talking among themselves. But let me tell you one truth. You and I have been privileged to be given this Bible and the angels of God don't have this Bible. You know this? We have been given this to get safe. Why would they need to get safe? Many years ago, in the year 1984, I entered into my prayer closet to pray. You know, in India, we have uh, some little customs and traditions. So before we start worshipping, we'll just say a prayer. We'll just pray. That's called the opening prayer. So I was all alone, and you know, traditions don't die easily. So I knelt down to pray. I said, Lord, I'm going to worship you. Please fill this place with your presence. As soon as I opened my eyes, I saw two angels standing before me. And they were shorties like me. One had a little drum in his hand, and the other had a symbol in his hand. So I asked them, what are you doing here? So they said, we have come to worship God with you. 
I said, all right. So I opened my song book. So the songs were all in my native Indian language. So I looked at them, I said, oh, by the way, I'm going to sing them in this Indian language. Do you know this language? So they looked at me, they smiled. You know, all beings in heaven have this beautiful smile on their face, which shows, oh, you dumb fool. <laughs> they are too kind to say those words but the smile on their face tells you that <laughs> so I said all right let's sing this song and as I started singing they all join in the singing and we sang a few songs and I noticed something that day when we sang a song that was exalting the name of Jesus for some reason I just opened my eyes at that moment and I saw those two angels lying on their face worshipping the name of Jesus. After their worship, I asked them, what happened that you were lying on your face when you were worshipping? They said, whenever the name Jesus is mentioned in heaven, every person will fall on their face and worship that name. But look at what we do on earth. We are sitting comfortably in our chairs. Right? We care less about the name of Jesus. The scripture says that name is exalted above all other names. It's not just in a, a, a status of exaltation, you know. It's real. At the mention of the name, all knees bow, all tongues confess. I saw this that day, the angel bowing down. So after the worship was over, I was going to meditate the word of God. So I told the two angels, all right, worship is over, now you can go. <laughs> and they lingered on. I said, why are you still here? I said, worship is over. So they said, now this really astounded me. They told me, teach us the word. I said, what do you mean teach you the word? Don't you all know the word? They said, no. This Bible is given to you all. The mysteries of the word, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven are given to you all, not to us. Later on, I found a scripture in the book of 1st Peter that talks like that. That the angels desire to look into the things of God. They desire to look into the things of God. I understood the scripture in a greater way from that experience. So I said, alright, sit down. So, I turned to a passage of scripture and I said, now this is what the Bible says and then we went on discussing in deeper revelation of what the word really was. So an hour passed by and after that I said, okay, now this is finished. And they stood up, they thanked me and they disappeared. You know, angels of God are desirous. Whenever you meditate the word of God, they come and stand very close to you and they'll peep over what you are reading. Because they like to learn. They like to know. To us is given this privilege. Jesus. To know the mind of Christ. To be possessed with the mind of Christ. The angels are not made like that. See, this is the big difference. We are made to be sons of God. They are not. They are just creatures. Amen? Wow. Whereas you are different. You are made in whom he that cannot be created with hands and he that the heavens is not big enough to possess has made himself small to come inside us not inside the angels this mystery the angels desire to learn and they come and learn from you 
So when the heavens are open, we see visions that are communicative for the ministry that we are called to do. You know the Bible says in Acts, in Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18, without vision people perish. Why people are perishing? For silly reasons, because we have no vision. A vision doesn't mean a goal. Vision means a vision communicated from heaven. For you, if you read Acts chapter 10 verse 11, when the Apostle Paul was called, or rather the Apostle Peter, while they were waiting, while he was waiting for lunch to be made ready, he was praying. He fell into a trance. He saw a vision. And through the vision, God spoke to him not to alienate the Gentiles. And you will read that in the book of Acts, visions were a common occurrence in the lives of the apostles that were very helpful to guide them to do the work that God has called them to do. You know, the work of God you can never do that out of your own imagination. It is not your work. It is the work of God. Amen? Amen. You know, God called me to establish a 24-hour TV station in India. And the Lord told me, gave me a mandate. He said, as God spoke to the Lord Jesus Christ in these last days, and in this last age before the Lord Jesus Christ comes again, one more time, He is going to speak to the entire world. And He was going to use this
Oh, oh, oh. 